My name is Stefan Schurek. I'm heading the Climate Energy Department at the World Future Council, which is a policy think tank NGO based uh, in Hamburg, Germany. The title of my presentation is From Agropolis to Ecopolis heading towards regenerative cities. And I think we have um, something to contribute to the discussion uh, for a new model of urbanization. So let's take a look of where people um, are actually coming from. Uh, human species used to live in cities of the size of 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 people, um, what we at the World Future Council called uh, the Agropolis. And as you can see in this graph, the resources for this city actually came from within the city borders or from its direct hinterland. That was sort of the concept of how people used to live together in the polis or um, what we call the agropolis. Now this is how the agropolis actually looked like but as you know, no surprise, when we think of cities today we're not having in mind cities like Monteregioni in the Tuscany and there are very few of them left. Cities nowadays look quite different. Why is that? Because we have started the process of industrialization and that is 100% linked to the discovery of fossil fuels and the combustion of fossil fuels and our ability to build machines, to uh, actually get hold of more fossil fuels, to build bigger machines and so on and so forth. So we essentially started a self-perpetuating cycle of automatization um, then um, added um, you know, new forms of transport such as commercial aviation, cars, uh, then came up with nuclear energy, microchips, the internet and so on and so forth. Um, this went along with a massive increase of energy demand and with um, quite a few big issues that we have to solve. So I think when we look into the future, the future is not going back to Stone Age, but the future is making sure that the big achievements, the positive achievements of this process of industrialization are actually being saved, such as democracy, such as access, democratic access to information and so on and so forth, and getting rid of the problems such as climate change, pollution, um, you know, bad sanitation and so on and so forth. I think that's essentially the task uh, for our cities in the future. Let's take a look into the energy markets, for example, in um, Germany. Um, I know Germany is famous for its beer and for its cars and uh, just most recently also for its renewable energy and I will come to that in a minute. But we also need to see the downside of uh, Germany's industrialization. And this is pretty much related to the discovery of fossil fuels and to the combustion of fossil fuels. And this is just, you know, what happens while we are speaking. We are still mining lignite, one of the very, very few countries who are doing this. It's a very dirty business. We're spending a lot of money with it. We are relocating hundreds of thousands of people for the purpose of getting hold of the lignite. We are wiping off the map huge villages uh, just for the purpose of ba basically getting hold of the lignite, uh, burning it and boiling water with it. That steam then runs the turbines. This is how it looks like. We don't even hesitate to move away churches from a village and the rest of it goes down the drain. This is really one of the downsides of the energy production in um, Germany, just this is another example of the year 2013, the city of Erkelenz with this beautiful church there. The pictures are been taken just a couple of uh, months ago in the year 2013 and they're not there anymore. The church has been excavated away, the houses have been excavated away and it looks a little bit like this picture that um, we've been taken in um, uh, the south uh, west part of um, Germany. It's not only about coal, it's of course also around oil. Our cities are actually designed around um, oil and uh, the combustion of oil in our cars. Um, and we started in the Western world, if you like, in cities like South, um, 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 South America or in the cities especially in um, the United States and San Francisco with designing the city more and more around the car, you know, just making 
making space, creating space, not for the people, but basically for the car. And this is just something that I find, you know, that really struck me, this poster, um, which was um, from 1930 or 1940, basically saying, you know, crossing the street in San Francisco is more dangerous than dynamite, uh, not advocating against cars, but just warning us to not cross the street. So this is not how it should look like, but it still looks like that in many parts of the world, in Asian cities in particular, we are designing the city around the car and this is a building um, that still sits there that um, has been no removed finally but um, uh, you know um, kept up a long long year resistance against um, a street all the rest of it went down the drain already and it symbolizes this picture actually symbolizes very well how we design um, the city uh, of today what we think is actually an expression of an expression of um, progress. So uh, the result of that is a massive pollution in many parts of the uh, world, in the big cities, uh, in cities like Beijing or Shanghai or um, uh, Lagos, and of course uh, climate change. Though the city nowadays is not Agropolis and, and the tiny little Monte Regione city in the Tuscany, it's Petropolis, a city 100% dependent on fossil fuels and nuclear power. One of the other results, next to pollution and um, you know and 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 congestion in the cities and uh, people not having space there anymore, is of course climate change. We have actually met the figure or the benchmark of 400 uh, parts per million in the atmosphere of CO2 concentration, which is the dangerous part uh, and the dangerous pathway to go beyond the average temperature increase of two degrees. Are we taking this two degrees benchmark really seriously? Well, I'm afraid not. When we came to Doha Climate Conference in the end of, year, of the year 2012, every participant, every delegate from all parts of the world have been welcomed with these little posters. And I've taken this picture from a bus because I couldn't actually believe what I saw. They obviously got it wrong. They obviously, they wanted to say, welcome to a two degrees world. That's what the tagline said. That's what the tagline said. But essentially, they got it wrong because the sign says, welcome to the beyond two degrees world. And this is, of course, a, a failure of the PR agency, which, by the way, they corrected a couple of days later and just removed all the posters and put new ones to it and corrected it. But it was sort of representing the sense of urgency that um, I feel on this climate conferences. Uh, in fact, we are not really, really taking decisions um, to uh, remain beneath this really, really dangerous benchmark of global average temperature increase um, of more than two um, degrees. Uh, another um, impact of this fossil fuel driven industrialization is that our cities are also prone to the consequences of climate change and to the impact, uh, such as extreme weather uh, events uh, like the Hurricane um, Sandy in the year 2012, which left a huge part of Manhattan in the dark for actually quite, uh, I think, two nights or so. So, um, you know, um, we are not only producing the problem as the cities, we are also victim to uh, the results of it. And that's another reason to uh, take action to against it. So this is just summarizing the facts that I've just alluded to. Uh, world population um, um, grows, continues to grow, um, as also a consequence of fossil fuel driven economies and industrialization. The world resource demand increased by 16 for the world energy demand. Um, increased by 500% only within the last uh, six decades. And cities are the um, center spot, if you like, or um, the focus um, or the crystallization of the problems that uh, we have to address. So the question is not necessarily um, aren't city good for us or bad for us uh, or is it the triumph or the tragedy of the cities yes of course cities can be very efficient they can host many people on various levels and so on and so forth and so on and so forth it actually very much depends on how we design um, the cities and one guiding principle that the world future council suggests is actually coming from agropolis over to petropolis heading towards the ecopolis where a city derives you know, um, its resources from its hinterland 
and takes care for the resources coming from um, more beyond the hinterland, um, that this happens actually in a sustainable way. The World Future Council has described this more precisely in the concept of regenerative city, basically saying a city should not absorb more resources than it could actually generate within its own boundaries and of course beyond, because clearly a city like London will most probably not um, harvest enough energy from within its boundaries, um, but uh, a city of London can actually make sure that the resources it absorbs are being created and generated in a sustainable way. So the idea of these regenerative cities is a holistic approach, you know, um, taking into account uh, the economic factors, the social factors of a, a concrete place, um, the environment, um, making city, um, cities more resilient um, against um, impacts of climate change already uh, affecting um, our cities, um, thinking in a circular metabolism, you know, making, making cities sustainable um, and thinking of the various levels of action, local, national and international. So this is sort of, this all needs to be tied together into one strategy to move towards regenerative cities. And I've just said a circular metabolism. This is really one of the core of the concepts of regenerative cities. Looking at the city as an organism, at the moment it is basically um, based on a linear metabolism. We're putting resources into the city, it's been absorbed, converted and left behind is waste. Waste in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere, plastic in the oceans, um, waste in terms of chemical waste in our, in our water. We basically do not uh, regain the nutritions that are um, um, incorporated in the, in the sewage, for example, and lead this back into the agricultural process. No, we just try to try to manage sewage in a way of, you know, some cities still are leaking it into the ocean. So this is um, a linear metabolism and what we need to do is we need to think in a circular metabolism for a city where the resources are being regenerated. Factors to be taken into account when designing and road mapping the strategy towards a regenerable uh, or a regenerative city is of course the geography of every single place, the economic situation, um, the political situation um, and the technological environment, what manufacturing, for example, is there um, already present in the country, uh, what can neighbor countries do for the cities and so on and so forth. But the last point I find even more important is to take into account what I call the cognitive environment, basically meaning what do people know about sustainability and what do they need to know actually to be taken onto on board. And um, one thing that is really, really important to design the strategy towards the regenerative cities is that you create this in a multi-stakeholder process, in a participatory process where people feel their own ownership in the strategy uh, for a more sustainable or in fact a regenerative cities. This is just, um, you know, summarizing a little bit the um, strategy. Uh, we're talking about a restorative relationship between cities and the local hinterland. Um, we need to uh, re-understand the dynamic of a circular metabolism that the nature, you know, basically exists from or builds on. We need to relearn it and transform it into modern concepts of designing um, our cities. So one uh, good example for designing a regenerative cities is the energy market. Let's go just very quickly back um, to Germany. As I said, um, you know, big uh, coal companies and nuclear companies have been basically providing the energy for the cities in Germany, such as RWE, E.ON or Vattenfall. They've been not only producing the energy, they have been also owning the grid, uh, basically determining um, the level playing field for the energy markets in this country. And I think this is not any longer the business model anymore for the future. Um, the future is not that the big energy company's business model is to sell as many kilowatt hours as possible for a good price, but it is uh, to become a service provider for a decentralized energy production. The next slide is just a uh, video that shows a little bit um, how the business model of the future is actually functioning. This video shows 
um, data from the University of Delft, coming from the Bundesnetzagentur in Germany, um, where in the last uh, five years, 860,000 photovoltaic installations have been put on the rooftops or have been put on the buildings of, you know, of a of a farm or have been put on the rooftops of um, governmental buildings. You name it. Um, when you take a train ride through Germany from the south to the north, you will hardly find um, many buildings that have not um, solar panels on the rooftops if they're disposed to the sun. So this is really sort of the future um, where you harvest the energy where it exists and that's in a decentralized way and where you convert it then into electricity and you use it for your own purposes or you share it over the electricity grid with others. That's sort of the business model of the future. Um, Germany went up from 3% in the year 2000 now to 25% electricity production only from renewables. And on a sunny day, a country with more than 80 million people can actually derive more than 30% of its electricity only from solar panels. If you would have told me this to be happen in the next 20 years, I probably wouldn't have not believed it. So the World Future Council calls this concept, which is based on a feed-in tariff legislation implemented first in 1990, but actually made successful in the year 2000 by the Red-Green uh, governmental coalition, the power to the people approach. And this is in the double sense. It gives power to the people to basically produce their own power and this removes political power, if you like, from the energy companies um, uh, that they are basically determining the prices that you have to pay for it. I think that is really the concept, the power to the people approach led in many parts of the world to an uptake of renewables. We are in the year 2011, we were at 70 gigawatts only coming from solar and the price for the solar installations is continuing to go, uh, to go down and it's already competitive with conventional types of energy. What is the next step? I think one of the next steps to move towards regenerative cities is to set a 100% renewable energy target for your cities. Cities like Frankfurt or Munich have set this target, for example, and are now in the process of road mapping it and implementing the road map. More than 100 regions in Germany have actually set this 100% renewable energy um, target representing more than 20 million inhabitants of this country, um, not necessarily waiting for the national government or even the international agreement on, uh, uh, on a climate um, agreement, um, but basically just, you know, um, starting to take action on their own, setting a target, road mapping it, and then basically starting to harvest the energy that surrounds them. That is sort of the concept. Um, the city of Dardesheim, just for example, is a city that already goes beyond 100%. They're producing more than 100% electricity, essentially saying um, they are providing uh, electricity to other cities as well with a wind park. What is the main motivation? It's of course environmental concerns, it's of course you know the image concern of being you know um, autark from uh, energy companies, but the main reason, and this shows an opinion poll by by the um, DENET organization who serves the 100% regions in Germany to set up this target and to help them. Um, this opinion poll um, basically said, well, the local value creation, that is the main motivation for the people to back such a 100% strategy. They just understand it's better to leave the money for the energy production in our own region rather than sending it to countries where um, they produce oil or where they produce coal or sending it to the big energy companies. So that is sort of the key factor that motivates people um, and that led to sort of the um, understanding that if you participate people in the renewable energy uptake they will of course accept the infrastructural measures that are important be it for the grid or be it for wind turbines um, um, in the in the backyards, if you like, and the acceptance then, of course, leads to a um, uh, friendly investment climate. And I think that's the key. And my last slide just um, gives me the chance to remind ourselves we basically understood the absolutely inexhaustible power of renewable energy uh, already a couple of decades ago. 
um, and this is this quote is coming from Thomas Edison in the year 1920, who was, as you know, um, one of the famous industrialists in, um, in the United States. And he basically said, we are like tenant farmers shopping down the fence around our house for fuel and we should be using nature's inexhaustible sources of energy, sun, wind and tide. I put my money on the sun and solar energy, what is source of power? I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. He was so wise and he didn't even know anything about pollution, climate change and the problems of industrialization. So let's remind that, let's move on, let's set 100% targets, let's move towards regenerative cities. Thank you.